Good evening. Uh, it's great to see so many of you here. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, we, of course, have Imogen Grant here, uh, first and third novice to world champion rower. It's quite an extraordinary accomplishment. Um, I hope you're really excited for the talk. Uh, just a couple of bits of housekeeping. Uh, this talk is being uh, recorded, and there is, of course, photography as well. Um, and secondly, uh, please leave the questions to the end of the talk. There'll be a Q&A section at the end. Uh, so without further ado to the main part of the talk, uh, Imogen Grant. Thank you very much. Um, I'm assuming you can all hear me if I just speak like this. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope it's not too boring and I hope maybe you can leave having learned something today. Um, it's really strange to be back. I'm still a student at Trinity, but I live um, out in the grad accommodation on Newton Road. So actually, I don't really get the chance to come back to the main college very often. So walking back in, I felt like I kind of had to find Winstanley Lecture Theatre by muscle memory because I was like, where is that place again? I can't remember. Um, but as soon as I walked through the door and saw the first and third tessellating line bucket hat, I knew I was <laughs> in the right place. Um, so yeah, thank you very much, Luke, for inviting me. And thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, Luke will know I emailed him a couple of days ago just going, how many people have signed up? And he assured me that people had intended to come and I'm really grateful that you are all here tonight. Um, so yeah, as Luke alluded to, um, I matriculated in 2014, learnt to row having never rowed before um, and since then it sort of has taken over my life. Um, I have done a few boat races. Um, I've done some international racing. Um, I've been to the Olympics and last year I, I became world champion. Um, I'm still a student. I haven't escaped quite yet. Um, I'm studying medicine and this is my final year. So after nine years, hopefully this April, I will finally leave this place and become a real grown up. Um, but I thought I would start this um, with a few pictures. There's only pictures on this. I'm not great with putting together PowerPoint presentations, but this is me in September of last year. And then a little bit before that, this was me in Tokyo, having just come forth by about an inch. And a few years before that, this was me <laughs> in 2014. <laughs> racing in my NW1 crew at Fairburns. Um, <laughs> I can leave that up. Um, I wanted to show you that sequence of images because I think a lot of the time when talks like this might be advertised, it's always Imogen Grant, the Olympic rower, or Imogen Grant, the world champion. And as much as I'm really proud of those things, it took a really, lo it took a really long time to get to that point. And those are the stories that you might not have seen and might not have heard about. So that's what I would like to tell you about today. Um, and going back even further, I'd like, you to, int I'd like to introduce you to seven-year-olds Imogen. Um, I grew up in Cambridge, uh, but never stepped in a boat before university. Um, and seven-year-old Imogen was curious about everything. I filled every single lunch break and every single after-school club slot with something different. I had six different books in my backpack every single day because I was definitely reading all of them and I wanted to learn everything. I learned to play the guitar, I sang in the choir, I played hockey, and I really loved sciences. It was about when I was nine years old that I turned around to my parents and said, Mommy, I want to be a brain surgeon. Um, and decided to pursue that ever since. But as I was growing up, it's, I felt like I had to choose. I did quite a lot of sport when I was growing up. I do, I do the school sports of netball and hockey and rounders and I always ended up doing the 1500 meter race on sports day because nobody else wanted to do it and at least I was stubborn enough to get to the end. But I never called myself a sporty person. I was just someone that did sports because it felt greedy. I was academic. I wanted to study medicine at Cambridge. That was my goal and I felt like I had to choose. And I chose medicine. Um, I loved it. I loved learning about the human body and I loved preparing. And the only uh, exposure to high performance sport that I really got was when we got to see the Olympic Games in London 2012. We didn't get any of the exciting tickets. This was us um, queuing up to go see the wrestling, um, which is certainly a bit of a niche sport. But I remember the atmosphere was incredible. But definitely at this point, I never imagined in my wildest dreams that I would be sitting on the start line at an Olympics one day. 
but back to my studies, all through sixth form, I started giving up my sports so that I could study a bit harder, take things seriously. I'd chosen to do five A-levels, and I was really focused on making my offer to study medicine at Trinity College. And I made it. I remember arriving on my first day of Freshers Week, butterflies in my stomach, picking out my favorite shirt to wear, and I remember the pride that I felt when I saw my name painted for the first time above the door of Angel Court, which was where my first year room was. But something else happened when I arrived at Cambridge. In fact, two things happened, I suppose. The first thing was, in my class growing up at school, I'd always been in, in the top sets. I'd always been top of the class, doing well, getting complimented and praised for how smart I was, doing well on tests. And then suddenly I came to Cambridge and I was getting essays back with two twos, third, written on them. I started struggling academically for the first time in my life. And as someone that had chosen medicine and chosen academics and put all of my eggs in that basket, it felt almost like an attack on my identity. I felt unsure for the first time of what I was meant to be doing. But the second thing that happened was that I started rowing. Um, for those of you at Trinity, um, I am assuming it still happens, but during Freshers' Week in my year, there was Freshers' Cocktails, or Boaty Cocktails. It was held in the college bar, and if you wandered in, foolishly put your name down for a taster session, they handed you tickets to get two free drinks. <laughs> I went along with my friends, put my name down, took my two free drinks, and waltzed out of there, happy and with absolutely no intention of going to the taster session, whatever. <laughs> I'd signed up with a, a different friend, and the morning of our taster session, um, she had basketball tryouts to go to. So I was just going to chill, have a nice, relaxing Saturday morning, but... The stars aligned and I found myself pulling on the one pair of leggings that I owned, a somewhat ratty sports top and a normal bra because I didn't own any sports bras at the time and chasing down the group that had just left from Great Gate because I was late and I made it to the boathouse just about. And stepping into that boat for the first time, I still vividly remember it. It was incredible. We were in one of the coastal fours and I had no idea what I was doing. We'd been given a couple of minutes coaching on the ergo and having done the sports when I was younger, I'd done a bit of gymnastics and I understood a little bit about moving my body and trying to understand sequencing and legs, body, arms and arms, body, legs and sit the boat, God damn it. Okay. But one of the seniors sitting behind me in that first session, at some point they just leaned forward and just quietly said to me, you're picking this up really quickly. I think you could be quite good at this. And <laughs> one, it was a compliment and it made me feel good and made me want to come back. But two, it wasn't, you're really tall, you're gonna be amazing. It wasn't, you're really strong, you're gonna be really fast. It was, if you keep turning up, I reckon you can keep improving. And I signed up for another session there and then as soon as I got off the water. That first term was magical. Um, I think I ended up doing more sessions than M1 did that term. It suffice to say, I'm a bit all or nothing <laughs> when it comes to these things. Uh, I loved it so much, that feeling of getting in the boat and learning something new. I was being coached by Neil Talbot, who I'm sure some of you know, um, and his endless enthusiasm running along, coaching us without a bicycle, purely on foot, um, and just imparting that enthusiasm and joy that he had for the sport absolutely shaped my experience in those first few weeks. Um, I regularly emailed the LBCs each week asking for more outings when they'd put out the timetable and I hadn't been put in one. Um, and it even went to the extent where I remember waking up at 6 a.m. on days where I wasn't scheduled to have outings in the hope that someone wouldn't turn up. <laughs> and, um, someone would message me and then I could dutifully cycle to the boathouse and sub in. <laughs> Uh, looking back now, I can see where that drive kind of started really early. Um, but luckily, with this club, with first and third, that drive was really nurtured and I was egged on every step of the way. The rest of my NW1 crew, once we were selected, we were all equally as keen, egging each other on, constantly improving, constantly being curious and trying to figure out what we could do better next time. I remember racing at Emma Sprints 
We dressed up as Dalmatians. I'm afraid I don't have photographic evidence of this because it was tipping it down with rain that day. But we made it to the final. But in the final, we went down by a couple of seats fairly early on. And I remember as a crew, we tensed up. We didn't know what to do. And we tensed up and we started rowing badly and we lost the final. But what was amazing was a few weeks later when we raced at Clare Novices, we were facing that very same crew in the final and we'd learnt. We'd taken those few weeks of extra training, thinking about what to do. And I remember we went down off the start again to this strong downing NW1, but we stayed calm and relaxed. And actually that time it was us putting downing on pressure, under pressure, and they were the ones that cracked and we went to win. It was my first pot and my first win as a novice. And I remember the feeling crossing the line and thinking, wow, we've won, that's amazing. I want to feel this feeling again. We were able to repeat the feat at Fairburns uh, later on that term. Um, I looked up the results uh, to prepare for this presentation. And I remember we were really pleased because we didn't go below rate 30 for the entire thing. That was our goal. And um, we came 14th overall beating at least half of the NM1s that year as well. Um, I thought, maybe this is it, this is the pinnacle, but it was time to stop being a novice and start focusing on the senior rowing. The training camp was amazing. I had a great time and selection for W1 in the Lents uh, began. I made it into W1 that term along with two other girls from this boat, those sitting at five and a bow. And we knew that we had quite a lot of pressure on our backs. The previous year, in 2013 Lents, um, the first and third W1 had won headship for the second time in less than five years. So we were going to be starting at head station in Lents. It's also pertinent to mention that my birthday, birthday is the 26th of February, which also fell in the middle of bumps. And I was very excited to be rowing and racing on all of these days. We were, of course, very nervous starting at head station, knowing that we had all this pressure behind us from all of the many years of work of the women's crews of this club from get it, to get us to that place. We were bumped at the railway bridge on the first day. It sucked. <laughs> Going from the highs of my novice crew and winning at Clare Novices and winning at Fairburns to lose the headship felt absolutely devastating. But we picked ourselves up and returned to the boathouse the next day to get bumped again earlier, <laughs> somewhere down the reach. We got spoons. We spooned off head and we attended that boat club dinner pretty teary eyed and disappointed in our performance. I mean, who could blame us really? There were three novices. There was only one returner from the year before. It had been a really tough ask. But the fact that we turned up with that hope and that drive at the morning of every single day of that bumps campaign knowing that we bumped the day before and just hoping and believing that maybe we could just row over that day. I'm really still proud of us for doing that. As you may have already noticed, I don't tend to do things by halves. And at this point, the rowing bug had really bitten pretty hard. Um, so the natural next step was to trial for the university squad. Um, I decided to trial as a lightweight, as if you haven't noticed, I'm not particularly tall and I thought it would be a better way in to the university team. Um, I was a bit worried about not being good enough to make the top boats uh, as an open weight. During this first year, I should mention as well that it was 2015, uh, 2015 Lents, uh, which was my first year at university. And that also coincided with the first women's boat race on the Tideway. I remember going as a club and watching it from Furnival Gardens and seeing both of those crews come underneath Hammersmith Bridge, watching them for the first time racing on the same day and in the same place as the men. And I remember looking at those crews and just going, wow, they look incredible. They're rowing so well, they look so strong and so together. I wonder if I could do that one day. And that was really one of the motivations for me trialing. It was just that what if, it was just, I wonder if I could, could do this. I was still improving and I was really excited and curious to see what I could do next and where I could take it. So I trialled for the university team and I made both the lightweight crew and Blondie that year. It was a bit of a unique year where half of the lightweight boat also raced in Blondie and the two races were one week apart. Balancing the training between the two crews was quite tricky and I definitely learned a lot about communicating between 12 athletes and not eight for the people who are racing both of these races. 
I remember this lightweight crew. It was my first university crew. And a lot of us, similar to that Lentz crew, I suppose, we were just out of college rowing. We were fresh, we were new, we were very inexperienced, but we didn't really feel it at the time. And we were so sure we were gonna win. We were confident in our abilities and we felt like we'd done everything possible. We were up half a length during the middle of the race, back when it was raced in Henley. Um, but the other crew, Oxford, they made a push and they drew back level and we didn't do anything. And then they made another push and they pulled out a third of a length on us and we still didn't do anything. And by the time we really realized the position we we're in and started moving back, it was too late. And we lost the boat race. I lost my first boat race by six feet. It was absolutely devastating once again. I'd been so sure we were going to win. And what was worse is that we had to race again in a week's time with a 50% different crew. That week was one of the hardest weeks, I think, that I have ever done. Coming off the back of a loss that I'd been so sure we were going to win, to try and regroup and figure out what went wrong and also make it worthwhile for the four rowers that hadn't been in this crew that had just lost and whose big day was still yet to come. But the tables were turned for this Blondie race. This was 2016, this was the year that the women's blue boat sank. We raced 15 minutes after the women's blue boat and had the women's blue boat that year stopped rowing, like the umpire had said, our race would have been red flagged and we would have had to stop. It's a testament to our blue boat that we got to finish our race that year and we were battling through the same conditions as them. But I think in this case, being a 50% lightweight crew probably was in our favor. And as we came through Hammersmith, having been a length down, we were able to row through Oxford. And just a week later, we crossed the line as the first CW crew to win on the Tideway. I remember this feeling so vividly, and I'm not sure I've ever experienced something quite like it ever since. It was a feeling of just pure disbelief and pure joy Going from the loss of that lightweight boat race, having to regroup, having to work through being down a week later and coming through to win, I'm not sure I'm ever going to feel that happy again. It was amazing. At this point, my season that year had been complete and I now knew what it was to lose and to win, both at a college level and at a university level. And so I started having my sights set on under 23s and also on a seat in the blue boat. So that was my goal for the next year. And setting that goal and being curious about just what if, what if I could just get a bit better? What if I could make the blue boat as a lightweight? What if I could maybe even get to GB under 23s? Having fought off three different people for the final seat in the blue boat, I made it the next year. And I also made it into the under 23 quad for my first international, international experience. It was such a cool summer and I felt so unbelievably out of my depth. Having learnt to row at Cambridge, I learnt to row sweep, but for lightweights the only modality is sculling. So I had to teach myself to scull over the summer so that I could trial in a single and scrape by on just stubbornness and pulling really, really hard um, to make it into the lightweight quad. In a similar story to the lightweight boat, I feel like we needed a first run at under 23s before we got it right. This year, we thought we were quite good, but we ended up coming fifth in the final and we were beaten by a couple of crews that we had beaten earlier on in that year. I'm not sure if we quite reached our full potential as a crew and weren't quite able to improve over the course of a summer as we'd really hoped to, but it certainly whetted my appetite for international racing. And once again, having had this experience, I regrouped and I knew what I wanted the next year coming round. The next year was 2018. I was once again in the blue boat uh, and I once again trialled for under 23s. The blue boat was absolutely incre incredible and at this point I felt so lucky. The two blue boats that I'd been up till this point, I was the only person without international honours who hadn't raced internationally at a senior level and they were all mostly older than me as well. I remember thinking, I just need to be a sponge. I just need to soak up as much information as possible. I'm very grateful to a lot of the people in those crews because I could be a very frustrated Imogen when something wasn't quite going right. And I remember the first time that I said to one of my friends, sometimes you just have bad outings. She raised her arms and went, Imogen, you just said that? <laughs> um, and I think about that now, even when I get off the water and it wasn't that good. 
having a bit more of a level head on my shoulders, I think, has really stood me in good stead um, over the last few years with the turbulence and ups and downs. But this year I was in the single, and this is a picture of me winning my first World Champs title in the lightweight single. Having learnt from the fifth place the previous year, I knew what I wanted and I knew how to go about it. And working with my coach Rob Baker, I was able to win by six seconds at the World Champs, which was something I had never expected that I was going to be able to do when I'd stepped in a boat as a novice, having no idea what I was doing in exchange for two free drinks back in 2014. Um, yeah, I, it's still an incredible achievement because I didn't really think I was capable of it. And at the start of the year, I certainly wasn't. I wasn't even the fastest under 23 scholar. Um, but by being curious and trying to improve over time, I made it there over a few months. It was at this point, it was 2018. It was two years to the Olympics. And I'd done all this by being a scholar athlete. There aren't as many pictures of me studying medicine here because they certainly don't look as good. And at this point, <coughs> rowing was sort of taking over. And it was at this point, I felt like I had a bit of a decision to make. My coach, Rob, at the time, he said to me, you know, if, if you want to go to the Olympics, you have to commit this year. You have to take that leap of faith. And that was something that had been really surprising to me when he first said it, because, well, ever since I was nine, I wanted to be a doctor. I was studying medicine. I was academic. But suddenly I was doing 12 or 13 sessions a week. And trying to hold those two things in my head at the same time was a bit strange, really. But having thought on it and thinking about my goals, I think that's when the Olympic dream really first became real in my head. It was a few months before this photo was taken. I'd not got any international results to my name, but I started putting into place the um, being able to take a few years out to study. It was the perfect plan. I'd stopped my medical studies for two years, intimate for two years, and then return, hopefully having been victorious at the 2020 Olympic Games and I took that leap of faith into the national team to be a full-time athlete and it was a pretty great year my year of sculling in the single had really set me up well for a lot of the trials which are also done in singles and come final trials I won final trials and so I was paired up in the only Olympic boat class for lightweight women the lightweight women's double sculls and I thought wow I've made it. I'm in the lightweight boat. This is the one that goes to the Olympics. All we have to do is book our ticket and I'll be there. We came fourth on our first regatta as well, which for a new combination we were really excited about. But one of the other girls um, returned from injury later on in this year. And after some seat racing, I lost my seat. And I was surprised. I was shocked. I'd just been under 23 champ world champion and the double had been going so well, but I lost the seat racing. I was good in my single, but I wasn't quite as good in the double. I hadn't learned how to row as a crew. And the other girl had beat me fair and square. The other girl, in fact, turns out to be my doubles partner for the rest of this story. Um, and so she's a, she's a pretty damn good athlete. But with 10 days to go before the final World Cup of the season, I was once again plonked back in my single. And so I went, right, well, you're not forgetting me that quickly. And with a single-minded determination, I'm not really sure that I knew I possessed, I decided to my, set my goal as, right, I'm going to win gold in the single, in the lightweight single at Rotterdam, which is widely known to be one of the windiest courses um, that there is. Um, I remember my time for this race, which I did win, was 8.46, um, which I think is potentially the slowest singles time to have ever won internationally. <laughs> But I did win, and it felt amazing. It felt like a way to show them that they're not going to forget me that easily. I won't let them forget me. And funnily enough, if you keep putting yourself in these positions, sometimes you get a bit lucky. And it just so happens that a few weeks after this, we were flying out to a training camp, and my luck was someone else's bad luck. One of the other girls in the double, not Emily, who had won her seat race and beaten me, but the other one, um, she developed a rib fracture, a rib stress fracture, and so had to withdraw for the rest of the season. And as a third ranked athlete, I was sat down on the very start of training camp, noticing that the other person wasn't here, sitting out here in sunny Varese. And I was told, you're in the double with Emily. You've got six weeks. Hope you qualify for the Olympics. Don't fuck it up. <laughs> and so began probably six weeks of the hardest training that I've done. 
Um, I sat down with Emily and Darren at the start of the six weeks and he said to us, it's going to be tough, I'm going to push you really hard, but I think we can do it, I think we can qualify the boat. And we all nodded at that meeting. And I think that's really powerful. We knew it was going to be really hard, but we all agreed that this was something that was worth fighting for, it was something worth working towards. And in 2019, beyond either of our wildest dreams, we won a bronze medal at the World Championships, not only qualifying the boat for the Olympic Games, but also picking up um, my first medal internationally in a, an Olympic boat class. Um, and you can see the shock on my face there. I was utterly shocked. It reminded me of that feeling of crossing the line in that Blondie race, where I just hadn't expected to win. That disbelief and that sense of joy. We'd been in sixth for most of the race and just nudged out a third place finish in a sprint finish. But we were set. We booked the ticket for the boat um, to Tokyo and it was just one year to the Games. All we had to do was improve a little bit and maybe we'd be standing on the top of the podium. I'm sure we all know what happened next. I remember vividly we have final <laughs> trials in the first couple of weeks of March of 2020 and news stories were coming in all over the world of cases, of lockdowns, of planes being cancelled and flights not happening and people having to isolate and testing positive. We were all brought out of the steps in front of the National Training Centre and Jürgen Grobler addressed us all. He said, I don't know how long this is going to be but we, all, we need you all to take an erg and some weights home and we'll see you when you see you. And then he proceeded to read off his Olympic selection. It was just the most bizarre feeling, this huge amount of momentum and crescendo and improvement has suddenly been paused with no re resuming date. The Olympics were postponed and we didn't have a date yet as to what was going to happen. I trained in my living room for about 16 weeks in a first floor London flat which got the sun for the majority of the day of a very hot summer. It was really, really hard. But actually, in that time, me and my doubles partner, Emily, I think we grew closer despite the fact we were having to train apart. Being able to hold each other accountable, being able to support each other through difficult days, really understanding what made each other tick despite the fact we weren't sitting in a boat together. So by the time lockdown was over, we were both raring to go and to pick up exactly where we'd left off, preparing for Tokyo. But I think without us either really noticing, COVID was stressful. I'm sure it was stressful for all of you. And it became a constant stress on us during the days. We had to wear masks all the time, as I'm sure you all know. We weren't allowed on the water for over 16 weeks over the summer. Building back our boat fitness and managing testing with lateral flows daily and the stress of if we tested positive, maybe our Olympics being over. It was a lot to manage. We stayed as strong as we could through this period and had some really amazing results. This was our first gold in the double at World Cup 2 and I remember being so happy about this. It was our last race before the Olympic Games and I thought, right, now what we've got to do is just keep doing this. Going away in the training camps, staying isolated. I don't think I saw my parents for maybe two years um, while we were training because especially at this point, despite the fact that the world was opening up again, we had to close down. It was maybe two or three months before the Olympic Games and testing positive and catching COVID at this point, that would have been that. Your games would have been over. But it was suffice to say, regardless of all of the down, downers about COVID, the Olympics was an absolutely incredible experience. It wasn't what I was expecting. My parents, my friends, my uncle and aunt and more people that I knew had all been planning to be out there with me. I wanted to see the, t uh, the city, I wanted to see Tokyo and travel and we didn't get any of that. It was just us, the athletes in the Olympic Village, carefully testing every single day, sometimes more than once and getting on the coach to the rowing course and rowing. But it was still electric. One of the things about rowing is that Usually when, an, when a rowing event happens, there's only rowing there. And most of the time on a 2K course, when you're at the start, nothing's happening. It's quiet until maybe the last 100 meters. But when you're in the Olympic Village, there's sports from all over. 
You can spot the gymnasts because they're about this tall, and you can spot the volleyball players because they're about this tall. Wandering around and just seeing everybody who is at the top of their game, the top of their sport, in, all in the same place, in this tiny athlete city, in the middle of a city we weren't allowed to go out into, it was still absolutely incredible. I have amazing memories of the 500 meter square food, food hall that was open 24 hours a day with every single possible type of cuisine you could, could possibly want. As a lightweight, sometimes that was a little bit difficult. I remember seeing Djokovic taking pictures with other athletes who were just as awestruck. Um, I remember having breakfast with Dina Asher-Smith. I remember sharing a lift with Tom Daly um, in the athlete village as well. Those memories are things I'm gonna remember for the rest of my life. But to the racing, which was really why we were all there. We knew that we had a good shot coming into the final. We'd won our semi-final in a world best time that had then been beaten just 10 minutes later by the Italians who won the other semi. We knew we were going fast, but we also knew it was going to be a really tight race. The winners over the course of the season had shifted quite a lot. Every regatta, there were different people in different placings, and we knew it was going to be incredibly competitive, and we were going to have to leave everything on the line. When Emily and I prepare for a race, we set out our race plan and we set out our goals in a very similar way to how we approach our outings. When we talk about what we want to do in an outing, we talk about it beforehand, we go out and try and do it. And that outing was a good outing if we can get off the water and say, yeah, we tried to make that technical change or we tried to hit that rate or hit that speed. For me, success is doing what I set out to do, doing what we set out to do. In this race, we did our start, it was a good start. We transitioned onto rhythm, we did every push, we followed every letter in the race plan. And as these pictures show, we gave it absolutely everything at the end. And we came fourth. Um, we're the third boat down from the top, and it was a photo finish. I remember the agonizing seconds of silence where we had no idea where we had come. I'm at stroke, so I see a little bit less. I'm not the one who calls the shots. And I could see out of my peripheral vision, I was fairly sure that we definitely hadn't won. There'd been crews ahead of us, but I didn't know how many crews. And it wasn't until it came up on the board, Italy, France, the Netherlands, that I knew we hadn't won. There was no medal. That was that. The end. Go home. And it was the weirdest feeling because there's so much crescendo. There's so much build up for this moment. But the, all that was going through my mind was, it's just a race. I guess that's over. But the thing that I really clung on to through the interviews and through the days and weeks that passed after that the, was that we'd done our race plan. We left everything out there. We'd done everything we set out to do. So how could I possibly be upset with that fourth place? A lot of the time when interviewers ask you questions or talk about the Olympics, they often talk about how fourth place is the worst place to be because it's so agonizingly close to a medal, but not. I couldn't disagree more. If you ask any athlete there, would they rather be in fourth place or fifth place or sixth place? or even further down the line, I guarantee you they're going to say fourth. Give me that fourth place. And I'm so proud of that. The racing was incredible. It was tight. And I have so much respect for the people that beat me. Coming back, I went straight into my medical studies. <laughs> it was a bit of a, a bit of a tough bounce back to earth. Um, this is a, the classic scrub selfie that I'm sure you've seen from lots of other doctors and medical students. But the only thing that was buoying me up in this picture is that those trainers are my Olympic trainers. They were the ones that I wore when I was at the Olympics. And that was a memory that I held with me over the last year. I think what going to the Olympics really gave me, though, was I lost that fear of failure. I went to the biggest event in the world, the most important sporting event you could possibly be at. And I was in the final that I wanted to be at, exactly where I wanted to be. And in a lot of ways, I failed. The worst possible thing happened. I didn't come home with a medal. But I didn't die. The sky didn't fall down. I didn't crash and burn. Actually, everyone was so proud of me and so happy. And I'm amazed at the number of people that lost sleep getting up at 3 in the morning to watch me race. And so this past year, year and a half, has really felt just so enjoyable. I've lost that fear. And I'm just really excited to see what I can do next. Last year, I raced another boat race, this time with Olympic champion Grace Prendergast and other Olympian Ruby Chu, and a whole host of incredible other rowers last year. 
One of the goals that I set myself when I came back from Tokyo was one, be fearless in pursuing what I do, two, find joy in every session, and three, give back to those around me. The last time that I'd been in a blue boat, I'd been the last seat in. I'd been the youngest, I'd been the one without the international honours. And last year, I had the chance to be the one that had the most experience of the boat race. And to see the improvement in these younger athletes, both in my blue boat and in Blondie and the lightweights from that year, it was a really strange feeling about being on the other side of that, but also really nice. I could look back and see how far I'd come. Luckily, through my exams, I still managed to pass my fifth year. And once they were out of the way, I was once again racing internationally. I managed to set a world best time in my single. And once I got my seat back in the double, got raring to go, uh, I also became European champion and world champion. It's been an incredible last year or so, and I really put it down to the last decade that rowing has given me. It's really easy to skip through these last few results because in a lot of ways, as incredible as the last few results have been, European champion, world champion, world best time, they also don't matter so much. I love every single session that I go out for, or at least I try to, and I'm pretty successful most of the time. I love getting stronger. I love working with other people who are incredible at, the, at what they do. And most of all, I love the feeling when a boat's going well on a flat water day when the sun is rising. And I know that's something that all of you can share as well. With talks like this, I feel like they always have to have a message, I suppose, at the end. And I'm never really sure what mine is, but I'm um, thinking about it, I think there's a few. Firstly, unachievable goals are sometimes achievable. I never really thought that I'd make a blue boat, let alone make it to an Olympic Games, but thinking of just what if, what if maybe I could, maybe I could just give it a go, and being curious about what might be possible has always been really important. And secondly, finding joy in every session has been absolutely transformative to the way that I approach rowing. When I started rowing, I would get so frustrated if something wasn't quite right. It would make me really upset. A bad outing would ruin my day, the entire day, having got up at five to do this thing that I wanted to do. I chose to be there in the cold and the wind and the rain. But finding joy in every session has always made me want to come back. And sometimes that's in the rowing, and sometimes it's in the people that I row with. And I know that's something that you all have too, in first and third, and in your other rowing clubs. And for some of you, maybe in something outside of sports, in choir, in your studies, in your music. So I hope that you can find joy in every session and achieve all the goals that you want to do. Thanks for listening. Okay, so we have, we have some time for uh, Q&A if anyone has any questions. So if I just pass down the mic. Very formal. Can you all hear me? Gosh, that's puts even more pressure on me. <laughs> okay, you mentioned that, um, okay, on this particular outing, we're going to try for a little technical change. Were there any magical technical changes within what you did that you said, this has really made a difference and perhaps you could describe such? Ooh. Um, I think one of the things that I've improved at most over my career is putting my blades in the water. Um, <laughs> if you hadn't noticed those uh, Fairburn Cup pictures, I'm not very good at it and I've never been very good at it. And I think the biggest change that I've managed to feel around the front end has always been about feeling about my finger, fingers and my feet at the same time. I know that I put my blades in quickly or quicker for me when I can feel the pressure starting in my fingers and in my feet as close together as possible. If there's a bit of a delay and I feel it in my feet first and then my hands second, I've probably rode it in and I think that's made a big difference. Amazing to hear your good self saying, I may have rode in. Um, Definitely yeah. have rode in. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's really interesting to hear that, yeah. No, thanks very much for the answer on that. That's cool. Um, this might be an obvious question, but uh, what's your 2K time? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
my PB, which I set back in 2019 and have not broken since, is 659.3. Um, what do you think about lightweight rowing being cut from the Olympics? It's not great for my future prospects, um, but I think it was sort of inevitable with the IOC program. There's a lot of higher, very boring politics that goes around choosing which events are and aren't in the Olympic Games. And I think one of the more important things is that there's now parity in the events at the Olympics. So there's equal events for women and for men. And that was kind of achieved at the expense of knowing that lightweight rowing is going to be phased out. Um, I think it is really sad because I don't think I would have got this far in rowing if lightweight rowing didn't exist. But also it does pave the way for things like beach sprints and coastal rowing as well. And I always try and focus a bit more on the positives than the negatives. So I'm excited to try beach sprints when it turns up at the Commonwealth Games or, or somewhere else like that. And for me, it might signal my end as a, as a lightweight rower, but I have plans of maybe seeing if I can take on some open weights. Steel or not? There's no one else. Uh, just a <laughs> <laughs> uh, Out of the crews that you're in, which one would you choose as having like particularly good crew vibes? <laughs> um, uh, my single, obviously. <laughs> um, <laughs> no. Um, the, it's sometimes difficult to remember, I think, because some of them have been so long ago. Uh, but this past year's Blue Boat was pretty incredible. Um, it's a really rare thing when international athletes from different nationalities get to row together. And the amount that I learned from getting to row in a pair with Grace Prendergast was amazing. <laughs> so that was pretty incredible. Uh, what, what would you say is your toughest race in terms of yeah, you, maybe it was more than you expected going into it, or it was during the race that it was the hardest battle to fight. Oh, that's a difficult question. I raced the Wingfields this past year, which is kind of like the boat race, except it's six singles all across, and anyone can go anywhere they like. Um, <laughs> And I clashed with another girl at about Harrods, so maybe three or four minutes in. And we both came to a grinding stop and had to restart, and I restarted in last. Um, and I saw red and rated very high until I was in front again. And then I was in a lot of pain for the rest of the race. <laughs> um, you, mentioned the mic. you mentioned for the most recent uh, boat race that you were sort of the experienced person in the boat. How did you find that leadership role? And what would you say to people trying to do boat leadership at a lower level? Yeah. Um, I think it was really interesting experience for me this year because I was definitely most experienced in terms of racing boat races. But I was also very aware that I had a lot of people who are much more experienced in terms of racing. Um, Ruby had been to two Olympic Games, um, and so had Grace. Uh, so I knew that they also had a lot of knowledge. Um, I think often what I found was um, I tend to, I, I want to make changes. I get frustrated when something isn't going right. But when you're really experienced, if you say something in anger, people are going to remember. Um, and I think one of the things that I learned to do this past year is, especially in crew chats, if I wasn't happy about something or frustrated, I tried my hardest to wait at least five minutes before I felt, before I spoke up. And a lot of the time I found that after five minutes, I was kind of persuaded otherwise, and I probably didn't need to say this thing that would have knocked the crew's confidence or, or made people feel a little bit disappointed or that I was frustrated at how they were rowing. Um, so I think for me, it was trying to lead by example and then also shutting up if I didn't have something to say that was going to be helpful. Thank you. Um, how did you manage your transition to like really higher level rowing? Like, I guess either from when you were in FAT to joining the university club or from there to GB rowing, like 
was it exhausting for you? Did it just kind of like work? How did you manage? Um, yeah, it was, tr it was tricky. Um, but I think part of the reason I've done everything I've done is because I'm very stubborn. And if someone says it's going to be really hard and maybe I can't do it, I'm going to show them. Um, but I think specifically um, when I was trialing for the university, one of the big things that changed from my first year to my second was um, in my first year, especially in Lent term, I got into the habit of going to breakfast and staying in breakfast until 11 a.m. and not going to my lectures, which really turned around to to have some consequences later on in the year. Whereas when I went into my second year, I knew there was going to be a bit of a step up. Um, so my approach was always, um, when I was in the lectures, I was working. And if I wasn't in the lectures, I might not be working. But I was really trying to make my time as efficient as possible. Um, and I think the only other thing was I made sleep my priority. Even if I hadn't finished that essay at half eight, 9 PM, I would be getting up at five the next day and I knew that I needed that sleep. So sometimes it was having to accept that I wouldn't finish it that evening, but knowing that if I got enough sleep, then I'd be able to wake up and do more of it in the morning rather than really struggling. Um, but it's never easy. Uh, but if you want it enough and enjoy it enough, you always find a way to make it work, mostly. I, I can't hear you, it's okay. <laughs> In a row. Um, yeah, also in yeah. Um, it's always trying to figure out what went wrong and then trying to make a plan of how to make it not go wrong the next time. Um, I think probably the big, biggest example was um, being seat race out of the double back in 2019. I, th I thought it was going quite well and then. Suddenly, I lost my seat race when I wasn't really expecting to, and the plans all changed. And it, it really was only by a stroke of luck that I got put back in the double. It wasn't by any performance that I had done. It was purely because someone else got injured. Um, but my plan that summer, having processed the fact that I'd lost my seat race, um, I just, one went, fuck you, then I'm going to win in Rotterdam in my single, because that's the best way to make sure that they don't forget that I'm there and that I exist. Um, but I also made a plan when I felt a bit calmer to try and talk to the coaches about a couple of things that I didn't think had been done as fairly as they could. Uh, and then my goal, it was kind of just shifting paces, shifting tangents. I decided there was, there was a fourth girl there. Um, and my plan before I got put back in the double was that she and I were going to row that double and just try and get faster and be faster. And then we could get selected. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure how achievable that was, but having those goals and those plans in place made me feel a lot more confident because I knew what I was going to do. For me, it's always about knowing what's coming next and having a plan and having structure so that even if something does go wrong further down the line as well, I know what my route's going to be after that point. Uh, at what time, at, like in fact, did you realize that you might actually be good and start asking yourself, like, what if I try for the blue boat and so on? Was it like, I don't know, like an erg that you did, or was it like a coach that said it, or did it some, was it something that like, you realized yourself? Um, the women's captain the year before, um, sorry, he was women's captain in my first year. She was doing a little bit of stuff with the CW development squad. Um, and so I think she encouraged me to go to the development ergos um, fairly early on, um, which I'd absolutely recommend to any of you who are even considering it. Um, considering trialing because just getting to know the coaches, not being scared to wa wander into Goldie, that sort of thing really makes a big difference. Um, but I think I was selected for the Dev Squad 8 that raced at Bucks that year. And we raced the Novice 8 and then we won by 13 seconds. Um, and I think at that point, that was when I was starting to think maybe I could trial, but definitely it wasn't maybe I could make a blue boat. It was maybe I could trial and not get cut. And it was only once I turned up and not been cut for a few weeks, it was maybe I'll, maybe I'll be in the top 15 lightweights. And then a few weeks later, it was maybe I could make the eight. Um, it was always a stepwise thing and, and that sort of what if. Thank you. Um, 
Um, <laughs> Yeah, my, my parents now know a lot more about rowing than they used to, which is nice. Um, and it helps that my uh, fiancé was also my novice coach, so he also understands. Um, uh, yes. Um, but, yeah, it, it can be tricky. Um, I'm very lucky that the people around me are really enthusiastic about what I do and also really supportive. Um, but... I've missed weddings, I've missed funerals, I've missed parties that are really important to people because I'm away racing or need to go to bed early. Um, it's definitely not without sacrifice, I'm just very lucky that I've got people that understand. Do I still feel like a sweeper who skulls sometimes? Yes, sometimes I do. Um, probably not until I was on the senior team. Um, a lot of that first year on the senior team and part of the reason that I was losing those seat races was because you can kind of row like a skull like a spanner in a single and go quite fast, but as soon as you row with somebody else, you can't really do that and you need to figure out how to row. Um, in some ways, it may well have been actually those six weeks leading up to the world champs where I won a bronze. That was probably the first time that I felt like I'd actually proven myself in sculling, um, having spent so many years predominantly sweeping before that. At this point, it's hard to say which one I prefer. I love them both for different reasons. How's the studying going? <laughs> nearly there, nearly there. Um, I'm in my final year. Um, I passed all of my written exams back in December, which was a huge relief um, to have those out of the way. Um, and I just have my practical exams left in April, and then I will graduate um, after nine years of study. <sighs> Turns out my brain really struggles to understand brains. Um, so probably not, uh, but I'm really interested in obstetrics and gynaecology and paediatrics. Um, but I am still interested in surgery, so I got it about half right. Oh, yeah. yeah I have one question. Um, so you recently completed the January. Mm. How do you, sort of, uh, you know, deal with Olympic level training and like, keeping the nutrition there? Yeah, um, so I have always been vegetarian. Um, I've been brought up veggie my entire life. Um, and um, it's certainly not slowed me down up to this point. Um, I think fairly hard about what protein I'm eating and I try and make sure I'm eating some protein with every meal. Um, but I was pleasantly surprised in January. Um, my sibling has been vegan for a couple of years now and being able to watch them bake amazing cinnamon rolls and cookies and things while it all still being vegan kind of made me think, oh, maybe maybe this wouldn't, would actually be a good idea. Um, I mainly did it because I really care about the environment and a vegan diet is potentially better than a vegetarian diet, which is better than a meat-eating diet in terms of um, emissions from food, which is a massive contributor um, to global warming. Um, but yeah, I was pleasantly surprised how Veganuary went, actually. Um, the first week was quite difficult because I realised I didn't have any vegan chocolate in the house or any vegan gummies. Um, but once I'd rectified that fact, um, everything actually went quite smoothly. Um, I was really excited to try new recipes. Um, I was definitely making sure that I had chickpeas or beans or tofu or tempeh or the vegan substitutes that you can get. And um, I competed two of my heaviest weeks of training ever in January and felt pretty good. And then um, last weekend um, I had a 5k to do and it's the closest I've ever gotten to my 5k PB um, in a few years since I set it. So it's certainly not slowed me down, um, which makes me quite excited. <laughs> um, 1808. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's the plan like for the future? I know when you graduate, you get a 
Um, well, current short-term plan is graduate and make sure I don't fail any exams. Uh, slightly less short-term plan is um, back to full-time rowing and preparing for the Paris Olympics, which are now about 18 months away, which feels very close. Um, after that, I'm not sure yet. Um, one of the things works with medicine is that almost everyone does their six-year medical degree and then immediately applies for foundation year places. Um, so I have not applied for foundation year because I'm intending on rowing full-time, not spending all my time in a hospital working crazy shifts. Um, so that is still an option. Um, but I kind of love this sport thing and I kind of love this rowing thing. Um, and I don't feel like I'm done with it yet. Um, so I'll just have to wait and see. <laughs> I, I can give it a go. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> That's all right. Thank you so much for all those questions. That was really lovely. Um, I hope you enjoyed the talk. And thank you, Imogen, for giving such a great talk. Thanks. Another round of applause.